For Unit 8, we'll cover Chapter 10, which is Deciphering the Genetic Code, and portions of Chapter 12. Use your objectives to guide you in knowing which sections to read. As a reminder from previous weeks, we'll be focusing on genes and what they do. But remember, genes are found on chromosomes, and they are small sections of our DNA. So a long, single strand of DNA has hundreds to thousands of genes. Each of those genes have to be duplicated. Remember, the entire strand is duplicated during the S phase of interphase. But this chapter is going to be focusing on the how. How are those DNA strands replicated? And secondly, how are those genes actually decoded? So each codes or has the instructions for building things in our bodies. Those things are proteins. We'll use a different techniques and show you how DNA is built and utilized. Recall that the human karyotype consists of 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. So we'll be first copying every one of those chromosomes to make sister chromatids and then secondly, we'll dive into those chromosomes and see how to decode an individual gene. Nucleic acids, if you remember from the macromolecule week, are basically long polymers of repeating subunits called nucleotides. The two nucleic acids we'll be focusing on this week are DNA and RNA. The information in DNA serves as our hereditary information, also is our basically blueprints for how to live and how to build structures. The RNA is going to be in tandem or helping that DNA, both in transcripting and decoding, but also in a regulatory function. Each of the nucleotides have three components. Hopefully this is all review, but let's make sure. Each nucleotide is made with a five carbon sugar. Remember that was a version of ribose. It then has a nitrogenous base. And for practical purposes, we're just gonna call them bases this week. They're also joined together with a phosphate group. Remember that there are two categories of nucleotides the purines and the pyrimidines. If you study the figure in the bottom, you'll notice that purines are double rings and pyrimidines are single rings. During the early 1950s, a literal race for discovering the structure of DNA was on. The two individuals credited with finding that structure were James Watson and Francis Crick. They were awarded its structure in 1953. But the actual information that they needed to build that structure actually came from other scientists. One was Erwin Chargaff. He was a biochemist who discovered the ratios of the bases were always consistent, at least in two categories. Rosalind Franklin was another key individual. She was bombarding DNA with x-rays. That yielded an image, like the lower right-hand corner image, that shows, well, you're looking down the barrel or the helix. She akined it to a spiral staircase. These pieces of information helped Watson and Crick put together that final structure and 
The structure they discovered were long strands of nucleotides with phosphates and sugars on the outside. Binding two of these strands were the bases in the center. From the diagram in the upper left, you'll notice there are covalent bonds between the nucleotides of a single strand and what we call hydrogen bonds joining the Chargaff pairs. You'll have to memorize the Chargaff pairs. The Chargaff pairs are adenine and thymine, always pairing together, and cytosine and guanine, always pairing together. For shorthand, we'll just call them A, T, C, and G. They likened this to a ladder with the phosphates and sugars as the outside uprights and the hydrogen bound bases in the center making up the steps of the ladder. The first thing we'll look at from that double helix is how we replicate it. Remember this is an S phase of interphase. Every cell must replicate its DNA. Every cell, including bacteria. That's because we need copies of all our DNA if any of our cells are to divide. Hence, we're making sister chromatids. To do this, we first break the double helix at its weakest point. That's the steps, the hydrogen bonds between the bases. In doing so, we're kind of unraveling or separating the two older halves or parent strands of the original DNA molecule. On each side of the parent, we'll then bring in new nucleotides and build a new half or a new strand. Sometimes these are called daughter strands. In order to do this, we have to have enzymes, helper molecules, because a double helix is happy being a double helix. First, we unwind and open it up, separate those hydrogen bonds. We do that using DNA helicase. Another enzyme, DNA polymerase, will help us to bring in those nucleotides and bind them appropriately. You have to remember the Chargaff rule. From now on, I'll just call it complementary base pairing. Wherever there's an A, a T has to go and everywhere there's a T, an A has to bind. And the same pairing rule goes for C and G. Both strands are replicated or copied. So remember, we're building sister chromatids. Now, there is a directionality, meaning the enzymes, as they work on these strands of DNA, actually can only attach on one side and work in the opposite direction. That's why we say replication occurs from a three prime to five prime direction. Now, if you look at the diagram below, you'll see the denotes three prime and five prime. Study one side of the DNA molecule and you'll see that five prime and three prime represent the opposite sides of an individual DNA strand. 
The five prime side is the side with the phosphate sticking out. The three prime is the side with a nucleotide that has, well, no phosphate. It's the opposite end. So there's directionality in each strand. Compare the right and left sides of that double helix. Notice they're anti-parallel. They run in opposite directions. So while one side of the strand has enzymes working in one direction, the other strand, the enzymes are working in the opposite direction. To help us with this, our cells use something called primers. They attach and sort of get the process started. Don't forget that helicase is the one that will help us to unwind and break those hydrogen bonds. And DNA polymerase, along with those primers, are going to help us to build those new strands or daughter strands. The entire process is known as semi-conservative replication. That's because, well, inside each sister chromatid, one half of the DNA ladder, one of the strands, I should say, is, well, the old, the original. And then there's a new strand or a daughter strand. So half old, half new makes up each double helix inside each sister chromatid. In this diagram, they're trying to show you the old strand, the bottom one, working three to five. The primer attaches to the three prime side. Then DNA polymerase is able to bring in new nucleotides, adding it towards that three prime side of the new strand. Some terminology that we'll need to know is that one side, or one of the strands, is known as the leading strand. And that's because as helicase opens our double helix and DNA polymerase brings in new nucleotides, they can only do so on the three prime building side. That means one side of the double helix can be built continuously we just keep unzipping and adding new nucleotides. But on the opposite side, because of the anti-parallel nature, we actually have to sort of work in little fragments. So it's like unzipping and copying just that section you unzipped, and then unzip a little further, and then copy that next section, and you end up with little fragments, what are called okasagi fragments. These fragments then have to be glued in the end to make one continuous strand. Because of this fragmentating as it's replicating, we call this side of the double helix the lagging strand. So the overall process involves separation of the two halves of the DNA ladder. Remember that's helicase. Primers attaching to begin the process and DNA polymerase helping to bring in the individual new nucleotides using the complementary base pair rule, remember char graph rule. Then we simply continuously build the strands or fragmentally build the strands. And then lastly, using DNA ligase, removing the primers and attaching the fragments. In the end, we'll end up with two semi-conserved DNA strands or sister chromatids. Now, if we dive down into the DNA strands and look at the individual genes that are in them, we remember that a gene is only a small segment of that DNA. And that gene, well, it's the instructions of how to build proteins that will go on to either build our structures or regulate and keep our bodies working. To do this, though, we have to get at that information. I usually akin it to, well, the DNA is a very valuable cookbook, one that's kept under lock and key, in this case, the nucleus. In order to get the recipe, how to build something, I have to get to that recipe that's locked up tight. So to do that, we use this process called protein synthesis. And it's a two-step process. First, we transcribe. That's where we go into the nucleus and essentially copy it because we're not allowed to check out those DNA instructions.
that transcription results in a copy of RNA known as messenger RNA, or simply mRNA. That mRNA is an essentially a copy of a recipe. It can then leave the nucleus and travel out to, well, do you remember where we build proteins? The ribosome. So it physically moves from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm to find those ribosomes, bringing with it the instructions of how to build a protein. I just mentioned that RNA is transcribing a copy or single gene of DNA, but that's only one of the three types of RNAs. The other two types are tRNA or transfer, that's because they transport amino acids, and rRNA or ribosomal RNA. That one physically makes up portions of the ribosome. All three are similar. They're all made of linked nucleotides, same as DNA, but there are some subtle differences, three in particular. The sugar is different. Remember in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. Here, because of the R in RNA, we're using ribose. We also have one of the bases that's different. Instead of thiamine, RNA uses uracil, and it's because of an incompatibility between thiamine and ribose. Also note that this strand, well, is only a single strand. Where DNA is double helixed, RNA is only single. That allows it for easy transportation, because remember, mRNA has to be built inside of the nucleus from the DNA, has to leave at the nuclear pores to arrive out in the cytoplasm at the ribosomes. Being a single strand allows it to move around more easily. 
The first stage of protein synthesis is known as transcription. Transcription takes place inside the nucleus and has some similarities to DNA replication, except the end product is making a messenger RNA strand. So the similarities are that one, we have to use a helicase to unravel and separate, but in this case, we're not trying to do that to the entire DNA strand. We're only opening one gene and copying into messenger RNA that one single gene. DNA polymerase brought in nucleotides, but it brought in DNA nucleotides. So in this case, we have RNA polymerase bringing in RNA nucleotides. The same base pair ruling works, except remember, the T is not found in the RNA and use U instead. Once we're done with transcription, we have copied only the leading strand, the continuous side, and we didn't touch that lagging strand, so there's no fragments. A single strand of messenger RNA is produced from the parent leading side of the DNA. We'll recall that also as a DNA template. We don't want to get into too many specifics because, well, there's a lot of detail that you could go further into. But for this course, we're trying to keep it at an overview. So we'll just say that that messenger RNA strand does need a little post-processing. We add a cap and tail and, you know, excise any unneeded information. So that processing includes introns and extrons. Basically, the coding for the actual messenger RNA is the exon, and the introns are the non-needed sections that are sort of taken out. When we're all done, we actually have only the instructions for a single gene for building a single protein in one single-stranded messenger RNA strand. The second stage is called translation, but let's step back a second and look at the genetic code, because in order to translate, we often need a dictionary, and this is our dictionary. Each three bases essentially are a word. They're coding for a specific amino acid. You'll be given tables in your lab and there's even one in your textbook. Make sure you get familiar with those. You'll see that each three letter combination of bases are known as codons and each codon specifies for at least one of the amino acids. But study the chart do you notice that some amino acids have more than one codon coding for them? That gives us some redundancy, meaning in a population, we can have some variation. In particular, look at the table below and look at the amino acid leucine. You can see leucine has multiple codons. I can count six right off the bat that all code for that same amino acid. That means each of us can have slight variation. We don't all have to have CUU. Some of us can have something slightly different, but as long as we're still coding for leucine, we have no problems. In translation, we have to move out to the ribosome and actually begin that process of decoding. Using the genetic code, we realize that, well, that is a universal genetic code all cells decode that same way. That's kind of nice so that we know exactly what bacterial genes are making as well as humans. Now in order to do translation, we need to bridge the gap between bases and the sequence of those and amino acids. So we're going to use transfer RNA as our helper molecule. Each transfer RNA carries one specific amino acid. And notice in this funny looking T, off the bottom side are three bases that stick out. These three bases are known as anticodons. They have to match or complementary base pair using Chargaff rule, the three bases or codons in the messenger RNA. 
That's how we know which tRNA comes in in which location. We have to have a pairing between the anticodon and the codon. When the first tRNA joins with the very beginning codon of a messenger RNA, that is known as initiation. Elongation is the adding to that messenger RNA of more tRNAs, each carrying an amino acid. As we elongate, we're adding to the entire length and building a protein. At the end, when we come to the stop codon, that'll be known as termination. In this diagram, you can see that the ribosome is actually composed of two sort of subunits. Think of it like little vice grips. The top one and the bottom one are working in tandem to hold the messenger RNA strand steady while tRNAs can bring in their amino acids. Remember, the goal is to build a protein. How do we build a protein? Remember, we have to bind amino acids using peptide bonds to create a polypeptide. The sequence of those amino acids to build that protein are coded in the messenger RNA. Each ribosome only has enough space for two tRNAs at a time. So the very first tRNA to come in is always carrying met or methionine. That is known as the start amino acid and the tRNA carrying it has the anticodon UAC. Notice that that will bind with the codon AUG on messenger RNA. This is the initiation step. We always start with this universal spot. After that, each of the codons tell each transfer RNA which one comes in second, third, fourth, and on. But the ribosome can only hold two at a time. So the goal is for methionine to pull in and then the next tRNA to bring in its amino acid. In this diagram, that is proline. What will happen next is methionine and proline will bind. A peptide bond will be created and that will allow the first TNR tRNA to release, allowing the messenger RNA to be elongated. I know this slide looks a little messy, but let's kind of step through it. I also highly encourage you to watch the videos that are linked on Moodle. After initiation, the first tRNA carrying methionine releases methionine and physically moves opening up its location. Now, why doesn't methionine just float off if it's released? Well, remember, it's bound through a peptide bond to the second amino acid, proline. And when that tRNA leaves, the first one, that opens up a spot. The ribosome moves down or shifts one codon, and a new location is open for a third tRNA to come in. Which tRNA comes in? Well, depends on the codon. In this case, our third codon in the messenger RNA has CAA. So only the tRNA with CAA complement, meaning GUU, is able to come in and bind complementary base pair. That will bring in the amino acid valine. Once that comes in, a peptide bond can be created between proline, the second amino acid, and this new valine, the third. We keep moving down, or the ribosome physically moves down one codon at a time, adding one amino acid at a time to this growing chain. Remember, this is all on the ribosomes, in the cytoplasm, and the goal is to produce a correct amino acid sequence or the primary structure of a protein. At the very end of every messenger RNA is a codon that codes for stop, termination. No tRNA codes here. That means when the ribosome reaches this point, it essentially lets go.
and that messenger RNA leaves, we're done building our primary structure of a protein, and now we just need to fold it. Remember the secondary, tertiary structures of a protein, maybe even quaternary? That's the post-processing of the protein. What happens to that messenger RNA after termination has taken place? Well, we could either recycle it, break it up into individual nucleotides again, or you could send it through yet another ribosome and make more protein. To summarize protein synthesis, remember the instructions for making a gene are in the nucleus. So we have to make a copy of that segment of DNA into messenger RNA. Step two, we have to go out to the ribosomes to bring together that messenger RNA with the tRNA to actually begin building the proteins. Remember that the ribosome is physically made partially out of RNA itself. That's how it can hold on to those other RNA strands. The courier is that messenger RNA. It is transcribed and then moves from the nucleus to the ribosome to bring out that message. In order to do this process, we absolutely have to have nucleotides and amino acids around for the building. Lastly, that tRNA is so essential because it can only carry one amino acid and its anticodon helps to in that decoding the deciphering from the nucleic acid world of bases to the actual protein world of amino acid sequences. We'd like to say that this process is flawless, but it's not. Mutations do occur and, well, we do have safeguards trying to correct any mistake that can happen, but it's not foolproof. Anything that can cause a mutation is called a mutagen, and we are bombarded with mutagens constantly throughout our world, from ultraviolet radiation hitting our cells and damaging them to the substances we either are exposed to or even ingest. Mutations, if you recall from a previous chapter, can be things like additions, inversions, deletions. So anything that changes the base sequence in the DNA would be considered a gene mutation. Those could be good or probably a better word is beneficial, and might serve as the raw material for natural selection. Think about a mutation that perhaps makes your muscles contract slightly faster, and you're a zebra. That could be a beneficial mutation. Some mutations are neutral. They happen, but nothing really changes. There's no harm to you, but no benefit. And lastly, are those bad, or what we call deleterious mutations. Those could actually, well, cause diseases, impair your ability to actually survive. The few sections of chapter 12 we want to look at are just really how do we sort of manipulate this DNA in a world in which to use it for a beneficial way. One of the things we do is we target plasmids. Plasmids are extra DNA in bacteria. These are not the essential chromosomes. These are extras. I like to think that they're the DNA a bacteria went shopping for. They're trying on a set of new genes that they borrowed from somebody else. These extra circular strands of DNA, plasmids, are floating in the cytoplasm and therefore are easy to take out of the cell and put back into the cell. With that knowledge, then we can manipulate those plasmids, adding extra DNA for genes that we want to insert. Why is this useful? 
Well, think about inserting a particular gene that you would like to build some protein from. We can have bacteria or even other organisms as sort of biological factories for making those things. If we take a particular gene and insert it into another organism's DNA, that is known as recombinant DNA because we're recombining it. Some of the best known examples are actually in the medical world, but we've also done this for a variety of other reasons, such as building spider silk and even genetically modifying our foods. So we'd have to target or know what gene in particular we would like to insert and then what organism we want to insert it into. In order to do the insertion, we use naturally occurring enzymes that were found in bacteria. They're known as restriction enzymes. The word restriction implies, well, they only cut or break the double helix in very specific locations. Now study the diagram closely. You'll notice that the enzyme has a recognition site, basically a sequence of bases it must recognize before it can break or sort of chop that covalent bond between the sugar and the phosphate. In the lower portion of this figure, you see the end result of a restriction enzyme. The double helix has been separated into two sides, but notice that it has left a sequence of single bases that are exposed. These are known as sticky ends. In this slide, you can see that we're inserting the gene that we want to insert or sort of hybridize into the new DNA. That location where the restriction enzyme cut and created those sticky ends, allows us for a location to splice in this gene that we're desiring. In the case of the slide I showed the picture of the spider and the goat, we're targeting dairy goats. We can splice in the gene for spider silk into this double helix and use DNA ligase to basically suture or bind everything together. Remember, DNA ligase was useful in creating covalent bonds between those fragments. The sticky ends allow us for a seamless overlap, and that alignment makes it so we know exactly where it's being inserted. Once that new gene is inserted into the DNA, we have combined or recombined the DNA, making recombinant DNA. We then can insert this new plasmid into a host cell, whether that's bacteria or even a dairy goat. That means because the genetic code is universal, dairy goats will decode that spider gene, spider silk gene, the same way a spider does and make silk threads in their milk. E. coli has been recombined in this example too, to be making human insulin. We can insert some of our own genes into other organisms. This allows us to sort of biologically produce, well, medicines that could be useful, like insulin for diabetes.
The use of those restriction enzymes has been revolutionary, partly because, well, it allows us to cut DNA in very specific locations. Remember those sticky ends? Restriction enzymes must recognize a specific sequence of bases before it'll cut. And those sequence of bases, well, depending on how long and how specific you make those restriction enzymes, yes, restriction enzymes are naturally occurring, but we can genetically engineer them now in labs. That means we can make it specific to where we want to cut. That allows us to cut up DNA into small fragments. Those fragments then can be what we call amplified, or we can make lots of copies. We do that in something called a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction. And essentially, we're just sort of stimulating the DNA replication process to go from one fragment to many fragments in a short period of time. Why would we do this? Well, this is very useful in things like forensics, where we want to amplify a little sample of DNA we might have collected from a crime scene, get lots of copies, and then we can analyze it. Those restriction enzymes allow us to cut the DNA into fragments. Then, through a process called electrophoresis, we can separate and visually see the different lengths of fragments that we've yielded. You'll do this in lab and see what those fragments look like in an auto rat or a picture that has separated out the different fragment lengths. You can then use that to determine, well, forensics and court cases. So I'll leave that to lab for you to explore further.